Millie, at least come downstairs and say hello. Grandpa called up the stairs. It was Christmas Eve and Grandpa had been blasting Christmas music all day long, singing Silver Bells and White Christmas and others of Millie's least favourite off-keys in the kitchen while he baked the ham and decorated the cookies. From the level of noise downstairs, Millie assumed that her aunt and uncle and cousins had arrived. This fact did not fill her with joy. Nothing did. Millie reluctantly dragged herself downstairs. They were gathered around an antique glass punch bowl that Grandpa had dug, that had dug out from who knows where in this house full of stuff. They were wearing Christmas sweaters, all of them, even her annoying little cousins. Aunt Sherry had on some wearable abomination with a reindeer that had a light up nose. Uncle Rob, her dad's goofy bother, uh, brother, wore a red sweater with candy canes on it, and Cameron and Hayden wore matching elf sweaters. It was all so hideous that Millie feared her eyes would bleed. Merry Christmas, Aunt Sherry greeted her, opening her arms for a hug. Millie did not move toward her. Hello, she said, her voice dripping icicles. Off to a funeral, Millie, Uncle Rob said, nodding toward her head-to-toe black and purple clothing. He always said this to her and apparently never stopped finding it hilarious. I wish, Millie said. Better to be in an honest, sad environment than a fake happy one. And she would certainly prefer funeral... That's a spelling mistake. <laughs> a typo, as you will. Uh, she'd certainly prefer funeral organ music to being forced to listen to Winter Wonderland again. Millie isn't celebrating Christmas this year, Grandpa said. But at least she's agreed to grace us with her presence. How could you not want to celebrate Christmas? Hayden said, looking up at Millie with big, innocent blue eyes. Christmas is awesome. He had a little lisp that came out when he said Christmas and awesome, which Millie supposed some people would find cute. And presents are awesome, Cameron said, pumping his fist in excitement. Both kids were so hyper, it was like their parents had poured them full of black coffee. Millie wondered if there had been a time when she got this excited over the holiday or whether she had always known better. Our culture is already too materialistic, Millie said. Why do you want more stuff? Her aunt and uncle and cousins all looked uncomfortable. Good. Somebody in this family needed to tell the truth. Shari plastered a smile on her face. Millie, won't you at least have a cup of eggnog? Drinking eggnog is like drinking phlegm, Millie said. Really? How would such a disgusting beverage become a part of any traditional celebration? True. Eggnog and fruitcake both seemed more like they should be part of a punishment rather than a celebration. Wash phlegm, Hayden said. It's that gross, slimy stuff that's in your throat and nose when you have a cold, Aunt Cherry said. Cameron raised his cup. Yum, eggs not, he said, then took a big, showy drink that left an eggy moustache on his upper lip. Millie couldn't take it. She had to get out of here. I'm going for a walk, she said. Can we come too? Hayden said. No, Millie said. I need to be alone. Well, don't stray too far, Grandpa said. We're eating dinner in an hour. As Millie headed out the door, Grandpa called for her to remember her coat, but she ignored him. All the houses in the neighbourhood had extra cars in their driveways, no doubt because of visiting family members celebrating the holiday. All these people acting the same, doing the same thing, presents and eggnog and hypocrisy. Well, Millie was different, and she wasn't going to participate. Hypocrisy, she thought again. And this time, the word stung her. Dylan had said he was a hypocrite because she judged, uh, she judged Brooke by her appearance. But boys... Even boys who seemed cool, like Dylan, were fooled by appearances. If a conventionally pretty blonde girl paid any attention to them, they'd think she was a saint and a genius rolled into one. No way was Millie a hypocrite. She was a truth teller, and if some people couldn't handle the truth, that was their problem. After one lap around the block, she was feeling pretty cold, but there was no way she was going back in the house yet. An idea popped into her head. Grandpa's workshop had a little space heater he always kept running. It could keep her toasty warm while she waited out the party. He was too busy hosting his lame little holiday gathering to go into his workshop. It was the perfect place to hide. Grandpa kept the key under a flower pot beside the 
the workshop door. Millie found it, opened the door, and pulled the chain on the bare light bulb that lit the small windowless... Why does it take so long to do this? <laughs> um, again, I think there's a... That lit the small windowless... She started turning the crank. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, there was even one of those horrible grinning monkey dolls that clanged cymbals together. Interesting. Uh, why did Grandpa want all of this stuff, and what did he plan to do with it? To repair it, then use it to clutter the house some more, she guessed. The strangest item among many was tucked into one corner of the workshop. It was some kind of mechanical bear with a bow tie, top hat, and creepy blank grin. It looked like it once had been pink and white, but years of neglect had left it a dingy grey. It was big, big enough for a person to climb into its body cavity, like in those science fiction movies where people drove gi uh, giant robots. The hinges on its limbs made it look as if its parts had once moved. It must have been a figure from one of those old kids' attractions that featured creepy-looking animatronics. Why had little kids ever liked things that were nightmare-inducing? From outside the workshop, Millie heard laughter and yelling, Hayden and Cameron playing in the backyard. She hadn't thought to lock the workshop door from the inside. What if they tried to come in? She couldn't let them find her. They'd go tell the adults and then she'd be dragged back into the house and sentenced to mandatory celebration. Millie found herself staring at the old animatronic bear, not just as curiosity now, but as a potential solution to her problem. She opened the door to the, mechanical's bear, the mechanical bear's body cavity, crawled inside and shut the door behind her. Darkness enveloped her. It was so much better than those annoying, twinkly, uh, annoyingly twinkly lights and garish, bright Christmas sweaters. This was perfect. No one would find her here. She could go back to the house after she heard Uncle Rob and Aunt Sherry's car pulling out of the driveway. So what if she missed Skyping with her parents? It served them right for being so far away from her on Christmas. Okay, another motorbike. It just went past my window. Lovely. We love loud sounds. <laughs> Kids, time for Christmas dinner. Grandpa called out in the back door. Millie, you come in too if you can hear me. Christmas, uh, Christmas and Hayden. Cameron and Hayden came running in, their cheeks pink from the chilly air. It smells great in here. Well, that's because I cooked you a feast, Grandpa said. Ham and sweet potatoes and rolls and your mum's green bean casserole. You boys didn't have not seen Millie while you were out there, did you? Nope, didn't see her, Hayden said. Grandpa, why is she so weird? Grandpa chuckled. She's 14. You'll be weird when you're 14 too. Now, go wash your hands before we sit down to eat. At the table, Grandpa carved the big, sticky, beautiful ham. I glazed this thing with Coca-Cola, he said. Found the recipe on the internet. I've been looking up a lot of recipes since Millie moved in. Most of them vegetarian, so she wouldn't starve herself to death. I bought this weird, fake turkey loaf thing for her at the grocery store. When she gets back, she can have it with a green bean casserole and sweet potatoes. I keep feeling like we ought to go out and look for her, Sherry said. Oh, she'll show up when she gets hungry or when she feels like she's made her point, Grandpa said. She and that cat of hers aren't that different. She's just at that age, you know. Now, speaking of hungry, who wants some ham? <coughs> I sure hope this is the last one. <laughs> I don't have a sword like a Saudi Arabian executioner, silly Millie, the voice said. But I do have a sharp sheet of metal I can pass through the chamber. It could pass at the level of your throat, or it could hit you lower and bisect you. And bisection is a sure way to go too. Either way, the job would get done. I think it would be smooth like Madame Guillotine instead of a slow, dull hacking like Mary Queen of Scots experienced. But I'm not 100% sure. This will be my first attempt at decapitation, yours too, but it will also be your last. As the voice laughed at its latest witticism, Millie pulled on the walls of the chamber and then trapped her. They didn't budge, but then she saw a tiny crack of light shining through the side of the door. Maybe if she could slip something, a tool of some sort, into that crack, she could somehow pry the door open. But what could she use as a tool? She took a mental survey of her jewellery. Her earrings were too, were too small and breakable, and her necklace was an unhelpful string of jet beads. 
but there was the silver cuff bracelet on her wrist. She pulled it off and pushed and bent it until it was nearly ruler straight. The end seemed like the right size to slip into the crack in the door, but she was too afraid to test it, too worried that, the, that her captor would notice. Millie, the voice said, are you still with me? A decision must be made. Millie thought, if she lowered her head and curled up into a little ball when the blade shot through, it would miss her. She'd have to be quick though and make sure she got her whole head out of the way or else she'd, be, she'd get scalped. If the blade came through lower to bisect her, she'd really have to flatten out in the bottom of the small space. Is there any chance you could let me go? She asked. Anything I could give you in exchange for my life. Land chop. There's nothing I want from you except your life. Millie took a deep breath. Okay, then decapitation it is. Really? The voice sounded tremendously pleased. Good choice. It's a classic. I promise you won't be disappointed. The low rumbling laugh. You won't be disappointed because you'll be dead. Millie felt more tears spring to her eyes. She had to be strong, but you could still cry and be strong at the same time. Tell me when you're about to do it, okay? Don't just spring it on me. Fair enough, I suppose. It's not like you're going anywhere. Give me a few minutes to get ready. You know what they say. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. The chamber shook and rattled. Then the animatronic's eyes rolled back outward, away from the chamber. Millie waited, her heart pounding. Why had she ever wished for death? No matter how hard life could be, how depressing or disappointing, she wanted to live. If nothing else, she wanted the chance to apologise to Dylan for what she'd said about Brooke and to ask if they could be friends again. She curled into a, as tiny a ball as she could, tucking her head under her arms. She hoped Millie waited for her heart, her, uh, her heart pounding. Why had she ever wished for death? No matter how hard life could be, how depressing or disappointing, she wanted to live. If nothing else, she wanted the chance to apologise. Wait, I've read this. Oh my god, I hate when this happens. It's so embarrassing. It's like, how far can I read before noticing? It's so stupid. Um, she curled into a tiny, as tiny a ball as she could, tucking her head under her arms. She hoped harder that she'd uh, ever hoped for anything that she was low enough to miss the blade. Millicent Fitzsimmons, you are hereby sentenced to die for crimes of humanity. Wait, Millie said. What does that mean? Crimes of humanity? You, the voice said, have been rude and quick to anger. You have rushed to the judgment of others. You've been insufficiently grateful and those who have shown you nothing but love and kindness. The voice was right. Different incidences of her own rudeness and ingratitude played in her head like scenes from a movie she didn't want to see. Guilty as charged, Millie said. But why are those crimes? Why, why are those crimes I have to die for? Those are crimes that everybody's guilty of from time to time. True, the voice said. That's why they're crimes of humanity. But if there's something all humans are guilty of, then why do I have to die for them? The voice didn't answer, and Millie felt a small tingle of hope. Maybe she wouldn't have to take her chances by curling up on the floor of the cavity. Maybe she could talk herself out of this yet. Because, the voice said, <laughs> you're the one that crawled into my belly. <laughs> That's a great answer. Whimpering, Millie made herself as small as possibly as she possibly could in the bottom of the cavity. If she got out, she was going to make it a point to be nice to Grandpa. He really had been good to her, taking her in and putting up with her moods and teaching himself how to cook all these vegetarian recipes. In the spirit of the French Revolution, the voice said, I will now do a countdown in French before releasing the blade. Un, deux, trois. Quick as a shot, the blade sliced through the chamber. Grandpa brought out a, plate, a platter of sugar cookies and set them on the coffee table. I'll be right back with the hot chocolate, he said. In the kitchen, he finally broke down and called Millie's cell number. Her phone rang from the pocket of her jacket that was hanging on the coat rack in the hall. Oh well, she'd come back when she felt like she'd proved her point. He hated to think of her being outside without the jacket though. It was pretty chilly out there. Grandpa poured five cups of hot chocolate and topped them each with a generous handful of Millie marshmallows. He carried the steaming cups on a tray into the living room. Who's ready for presents? He called. I am. Cameron shouted, I am. Hayden shouted even laughter, 
uh, even louder. Do you think we should wait for Millie? Sherry asked. She's not celebrating Christmas, remember? Rob said. Why should we wait for her if she's decided to be a brat? Grandpa didn't like the word brat being used to describe Millie. She wasn't a bad kid. She was just at a difficult age. She would come around. He crouched under the Christmas tree and arranged all her presents in a big pile, in a big pile so they'd be there for her when she came back. <laughs> That's actually really sad. I can't believe I'm reading this again. I'm kind of almost tearing up. Um... I didn't tear up the first time. That's weird. Um, <laughs> that's it. That's it. That is Into the Pit, for those of you. That, that's, you've finished your, well, almost finished. There is actually uh, a little bit more, and I've done audiobooks on all of this. Um, the Stitch Wraith. But this, this story was incredible. I really liked the story. It's so good. I think it's underrated. Um, Funtime Freddy, who we're all assuming it's Funtime Freddy. Funtime Freddy is great in this story. Um, very different, but I can imagine, like, Kel and Goff actually recording the lines for this. So they've got the character perfect here. Um, yeah, this, this story is underrated. I think it's honestly the best in Into the Pit. Uh, but what do you guys think? Uh, tell me in the comments below. Uh, next, I will be starting Fetch. Um... Obviously, um, for those of you who know, uh, the only stories that I have left to record are Fetch, Lonely Freddy, um, the other one, Out of Stock, 1.35am, uh, and then all the Felix the Shark ones when they come out, and then we will have finished the Fazbear Frights, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me on this journey. Um, I hope to see you soon when we record Fetch. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for watching. And I'll see you later. Goodbye.